Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming and for joining us in such a momentous uh, talk that we're going to have here. We are honored today to have a truly illustrious guest and dear friend joining us. His Excellency Dr. Jorge Castañeda is currently Global Distinguished Professor of Politics on Latin American and Caribbean Studies at uh, New York University. Dr. Castañeda served as Mexico's Secretary of Foreign Affairs from 2000 to 2003. He's a prolific writer, both in English and Spanish. One of his most widely read books is uh, Mañana Forever, Mexico and the Mexicans. And the book will be available when we finish the event uh, as a gift to uh, Hudson from uh, our distinguished speaker. Dr. Castañeda um, is certainly joining us at, a, at an opportune moment. Latin America and Mexico in particular has become a topic of discussion in American politics. Meanwhile, a new wave of democratic governance is sweeping across much of the region. This presents new opportunities and challenges for American engagement in the region. Given the positions on immigration, trade, and foreign policy that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have espoused, what are these pros the prospects for U.S.-Latin American relations going forward? How are U.S.-Mexico relations faring, particularly in regards to the Donald Trump presidential effort. Will the next president take an active role in the region? To answer, indeed, to these questions and to many others that will follow, we now welcome Dr. Castañeda. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, thank you all for joining us this uh, afternoon. Um, I'll speak here because it's more <clears throat> friendly and informal, and I'd like this to be uh, as informal an event as possible. What I'd like to do is maybe speak for around 30 minutes yeah. on three broad issues and then open this up to a discussion. Uh, for as long as you would like until <laughs> a little bit before two. Um, uh, the three topics I'd like to touch upon would be firstly uh, a very broad overview of the situation in Latin America today. Uh, secondly, the state of current U.S.-Latin American relations. And third, uh, what the uh, U.S. electoral process what impact it has or has not on Latin America so far, and what could happen in the future depending on who uh, wins. Um, the main characteristic of what we're seeing in Latin America today is that <clears throat> uh, uh, the so-called pink tide has uh, <clears throat> retreated somewhat and has retreated not so much because of a rejection of policies or of points of view, but rather simply because the end of the commodity boom of the first decade of this uh, century and through 2013 uh, brought about a series of economic difficulties in most of the countries, at least of South America. And uh, that end of the commodity boom essentially made it much more difficult, if not impossible, to continue to govern the way many of the left of center governments were governing. Governing well or governing poorly, but they were governing in a certain way thanks to windfall profits essentially stemming from the very high prices of oil, of copper, 
of iron, of coffee, of just, you name it. Um, and this allowed some countries to carry out social policies in a very responsible and serious way, other countries to carry them out in an irresponsible way, but largely, at least in South America, uh, this made it possible for much, many of these governments to thrive and be systematically reelected. Perhaps the clearest case was, of course, that of Venezuela and Brazil on two poles. Venezuela, despite electoral, despite rigging the electoral system and growing human rights violations and restrictions on freedom of the press, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, nonetheless, the Chavista movement was able to constantly win re-elections or elections. Um, basically because of high oil prices. With the amount of money they had, it was very difficult to lose elections. They actually almost managed to lose a couple of them, but uh, uh, even they weren't able to. Uh, and uh, because just so much money, by some calculations since 1999, when Chavez took office through a couple of years ago, they were able to spend something like a trillion dollars a trillion dollars in a country of 30 million people adds up to a hell of a lot of money for each Venezuelan. Uh, obviously, it wasn't spread out that way, but it was a lot of money. In Brazil, conversely, I mean, they were able to win four, the PT was able to win four consecutive elections uh, and to win them, except for the last one, by decent margins or very wide margins, depending on the case. And they were able to do so because of po social policies that worked rather well. case of Brazil, commodity exports are not as important as they are in other countries. But nonetheless, they did allow the government to carry out a <clears throat> series of social policies and other uh, aspects that uh, made the the government's popular. Well, all of this came to an end with the end of the commodity boom. You've had different left of center governments that have lost elections. Obviously, the, in Venezuela, uh, almost in Brazil, <clears throat> in a few others. Uh, in the case of Ecuador, uh, Correa was sensible enough to not to try for, to, to attempt re-election at least for one period. He may would have, maybe would have lost if he had tried. Um, uh, Evo Morales had a referendum on trying to perpetuate himself indefinitely in power. He lost it. Uh, and, of course, in Argentina, uh, Cristina Fernandez, his handpicked su successor, also lost. Uh, and then the ones who didn't lose, like Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, were uh, impeached and thrown out of office. So this is the first characteristic. The commodity boom brought an end to the left of center governments and the way they were governing. I do not see this so much as an ideological or political rejection, simply a little bit of fatigue and the end of the uh, virtuous cycle of high commodity prices. The second thing that I think is common to most countries in Latin America, and I think it's a very positive development, is this anti-corruption sentiment, uh, which is real everywhere. It does not express itself everywhere with the same vigor, uh, and that's, I guess, uh, uh, to be expected. Uh, in some countries, presidents have been thrown out of office or even in jail. The obvious case is Guatemala or Brazil thrown out of office, not directly for reasons of corruption uh, in her case, although there is a link. There's a little bit of a fallacy, I believe, in the debate about the impeachment process in Brazil and how uh, Dilma Rousseff is not personally corrupt, but now even Lula has been accused, was accused yesterday formally by Judge Sergio Moro of uh, uh, having received the equivalent of bribes from these construction companies, OAS, etc. Um, yeah, maybe she didn't enrich herself personally, but she did use federal funds or the, mach the state machinery to perpetuate herself in power. That's the logic of it. It wasn't the fiscal issue of covering up the country's accounts and using money from the development banks to cover up the, the, the deficit. That is a crime, an impeachable crime under the Brazilian constitution, but that's not really the point. The point is she was using 
all this money and the state machinery to perpetuate the PT in power. And Lula did it before she did. And that's at the end of the day what the Brazilian people in their own very strange fashion, which is not the one uh, I would necessarily subscribe to, but that's a different story. In their own way, this is the way the Brazilian people decided to punish the PT and Lula and Rousseff for this attempt at perpetuating themselves in power. Uh, in Argentina, it's a little bit the same, although Cristina Fernandez obviously did enrich herself personally. By Mexican standards, this is ridiculous, I think. How much did the minister throw over into the convent with the poor nuns? Five or six million dollars. Come on, that's what a mayor of a big city in Mexico does for breakfast. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, the logic of it was not so much that they're stealing the money. The logic is that they were using all of this to perpetuate the Kirchner a brand of Peronismo in power, you know, this sort of tag team situation. Unfortunately, he died on the way, but they were already working on the sun, putting him in, in line to follow her if she could have run for re-election again, not this time, but the next time, which obviously won't happen. And we can go on. The case of Guatemala is particularly interesting. The case of Honduras is less interesting because they did not replicate the Guatemalan model, as a parenthesis, uh, in the same way that the United States was uh, <clears throat> uh, decisive, very influential in pushing and financing CICIG in Guatemala, the investigative commission, uh, it was not doing the same thing, did not do the same thing in Honduras. Uh, the U.S. gave the Hondurans a little bit of a free pass on this one, and I think that was a mistake. I'll come back to this later, but uh, this is an area where U.S. policy towards Latin America could change for the better quite easily. That is, to push uh, or encourage or support anti-corruption drives in different countries. It was done in Guatemala. It has not been done in other places. So I think this second trend is also a very interesting and very positive one. And you can see it in one place after another. You can see it in Mexico. It, it hasn't uh, led to anything in Mexico, but it probably will with time. In other words, uh, I don't think anything will happen to the current group, uh, to the current team while they are in office, but I think it is quite likely that things will happen to them once they leave office. Uh, they have probably gone too far, even by Mexican standards of corruption, uh, and they, there probably will be a price to pay uh, after the current president leaves office in 2018. So this is a little bit the, the lay of the land in Latin America today. What has remained very incredibly positive and encouraging is that, by and large, <clears throat> Uh, representative democracy has held. Uh, it has allowed for a rotation in power. It first initially allowed for a rotation from the right of center to the left of center, and now is allowing for a rotation from the left of center back to the right of center. And this is something which, you know, you might find not especially spectacular uh, when viewed from the United States or from Western Europe or elsewhere. But in fact, in Latin America, this is not something which happened every day. And now it has happened systematically in country after country. The only place that's a real, real problem is, of course, Venezuela. Uh, and that is something that, you know, apparently has no solution to it. Uh, and whatever solution there is will be catastrophic. Uh, there is uh, either it goes on indefinitely, and the referendum is held, the recall is held after the cutoff date, uh, whereby there would have to be a new election, and consequently the vice president takes over and runs out Maduro's term, in which case Chavismo will have two more years, in which maybe the price of oil will go back again, up, back up again. And that is really the decisive factor. Almost everything else in Venezuela is subordinate to that. 
And that's a real, real problem. And it's a problem no one knows what to, how to handle anywhere in Latin America, which allows me to move on to my next point, the one I wanted to deal with, which is the current state of U.S.-Latin American relations. And the first point, which is the only critical point right now, is, of course, Venezuela. As some of you who follow this may know, um, Undersecretary Tom Shannon has been very active in U.S. policy towards Venezuela. But unfortunately, from my point of view at least, he has uh, uh, made a, a series of mistakes uh, that have led to the current unfortunate situation, which is that uh, instead of pushing the other Latin Americans to push Maduro into holding the recall vote and forget the rest, he has encouraged this ridiculous mediation effort, uh, initially by Leonel Fernandez, uh, Zapatero from Spain, and Martin Torrijos, and now only Zapatero, because the other two guys basically have given up on it, and rightly so. Uh, and it turns out that the only guy supporting uh, Zapatero is Tom Shannon, which is a kind of re ridiculous situation because uh, the Latin Americans don't really believe in this effort, uh, to the extent that the only guy left doing it is a Spaniard. <laughs> uh, and secondly, it's going nowhere. Uh, and thirdly, and perhaps most serious, the U.S. is going further, is bending over backwards to accommodate Maduro, even by selling light crude to Venezuela, so that Venezuela can mix the light crude with its heavy crude and is able to export a decent mix of, of junk, of stuff, to other countries. So in a sense, uh, the United States, because this can be, you know, this is a waiver of the 1970s law, law, 70s law, uh, forbidding U.S. exports of crude. In a sense, the United States is bailing out Maduro, and nobody understands why, or at least I don't. If some of you have any views on this, I would very much like to to hear them. I have no, I, I don't understand why. Uh, what I think the United States should be doing in the case of Venezuela is really pressuring the Brazilians, the Argentines, the Mexicans, and now after the signing of the peace agreements in Colombia and the ratification of them on October 2, which I think will take place, pressuring the Colombians also into adopting a very much more strong, much stronger attitude towards Maduro, specifically on the issue of the date of the recall vote. This should be the only game in town, that the recall vote take place before, I think it's January 17th or something like that, that it take place before that drop-dead date, uh, that it be held under international supervision, under equitable conditions for the yes and the no vote, and that if uh, Maduro is voted out, he's voted out, and a new election is called in accordance with the constitutional provisions that exist, and end of story. And once you have a new government there, which you would, because the Chavismo would lose the election, lose the recall, and lose the subsequent election, uh, then you have to begin a huge bailout, to the tune, of, tune, of, tune of 40, 50 billion dollars, to fix the mess that there is, but at least you fix it more or less institutionally and constitutionally with a constitution made by Chavez, tailor-made by Chavez, but all right, it's the one they have. Well, at least you follow that, and at least you go through this process uh, uh, in a legal, peaceful, and uh, constitutional Wait, the U.S. should be playing a much more active role in this. Uh, obviously, there's not a whole lot of time for this administration to do that, except if they don't do it before January, then they won't, it won't happen. And then the next guys, whoever they are, will have a huge mess on their hand because there will be no way to get rid of uh, Maduro's uh, successor whenever the recall takes place until the presidential election in 2018. And two more years of the current situation in Venezuela is probably going to lead us to a major uh, humanitarian and refugee and uh, also violent crisis 
way beyond anything we could expect. <clears throat> so that's perhaps the single most important issue in U.S.-Latin American relations today. Uh, the second one has to do, I always uh, perhaps insist on it because of the Mexican situation. Uh, Mexico plays a key role in two of these crises, but has to do with drugs. Um, as you know, um, it is very likely that on November 8th, uh, California will legalize a recreational use of marijuana. Uh, the polls are pretty consistent with about a 10-point lead for yes over no. And that for Mexico creates a, a relatively unmanageable situation. It is going to be extremely difficult for any Mexican government to continue to use the army and the navy and the national police and the local police, again, with, with violence rising once again, uh, to, you know, uh, <laughs> eradicate marijuana fields, uh, stop uh, trailers or trucks loaded with marijuana on the highways and patrol the nor northern border to stop Mexican mar marijuana from being cultivated, processed, packaged, and shipped to the United States, meaning California, where it's totally legal. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I always try to use the analogy of uh, <clears throat> the most well-known and respected Mexican in the world, who, as you know, is, you know, it's not... Uh, Salma Hayek, it's not Gael Garcia, it's not González Iñárritu, it's Chapo Guzmán, by far the best-known Mexican in the world. In all the polls, he comes out ahead. Uh, uh, name recognition and stuff. And he, you know, he, he's, he's the tunnel man. He does tunnels in life. And so he's got all these tunnels crossing the border between Mexico and the United States, meaning, again, California. And so the marijuana goes into the tunnel on the Mexican side, where it's illegal, and uh, <clears throat> you have soldiers looking for tunnels and shutting down tunnels and shooting guys who are filling the tunnels. And this mess on the Mexican side. But if the marijuana manages to get through the tunnel and onto the other side, there's a 7-Eleven right outside the tunnel where the marijuana, Mexican marijuana can be sold. Um, it's not great quality, because there's been a real drop in quality control in Mexico over the past uh, years. It's nowhere near as good as Mendocino stuff or uh, British Columbian stuff. So there's a real problem there. But still, you know, it's cheaper. And uh, so at the 7-Eleven, well, uh, this makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense for Mexico, and it makes less and less sense for Colombia, where cocaine acreage and production is way up again, way, way up, and for good reason. President Santos uh, <clears throat> decided that he was not going to continue to uh, uh, use pesticides <clears throat> to try and shut down uh, uh, coca leaf cultivation, and no longer going to send the army into the coca areas uh, because he would send the army in for drug reasons, but also for counterinsurgency reasons. Since there's no more insurgency, because there's no more war, because there's a peace agreement, which I think is a very fortunate development, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use the army to stop peasants from growing coca leaf, to stop somebody from turning it into coca paste, to stop somebody from shipping it to the United States. Like, why in the world should the Colombian army be doing this? There's no very good reason other than the United States wants them to do it. So, well, yes, but the drug trade fuels the guerrilla wars, and the guerrillas have been uh, fighting in Colombia for 52 years, and it's the longest standing war in Latin America, blah, 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 blah. Let's say all of that was true. It's over. So still keep doing it? Like, what for? So there's that very important issue. Then there's the immigration question. 
uh, which is a very complicated one. It's complicated. We're just chatting about it with Ambassador Darienblum, the Costa Rican situation, which is kind of back under control, but can get out of very control very quickly. That's the Cuban part. I'll look at that in a second. But in the meantime, you, we have a very serious immigration situation regarding Mexico and Central America and parts of the Caribbean and, of course, Cuba. And this is a very sensitive thing uh, because it has become a central issue in U.S. politics. Uh, and there's all sorts of walls. There's walls all over the place. Um, I can imagine a President Trump saying, well, actually, now that I thought about it, uh, instead of we, the U.S., building a wall between Mexico and the United States, why don't the Mexicans build a wall on their southern border? Or what we, you know what he could come up with? I'm just thinking aloud, but he might be interested. The U.S. will pay for the Mexican wall, and, the Me and Mexico will pay for the U.S. wall. <laughs> and that could be a good deal for everybody. Except, the, obviously, the, the U.S. wall is longer and more expensive. But you know, we can find a way to sort of iron things out. The fact is there's a very significant rise in Central American the number of Central American migrants the last few months, almost reaching 2014, summer of 2014 levels. And there's a logic to it. It's similar to the Cuban logic. People in Northern Triangle or Honduras, Salvador, and, and Guatemala uh, uh, also are informed of Trump's intentions. And if they believe that he's going to build a wall, they figure we might as well get in before the wall goes up. And so it's a, let's go. And that's what they're doing. And it makes a lot of sense. You know, they're well informed. And if they're not well informed, the, the smugglers are well informed. And the, or, the structures of organized crime that pay the smugglers and are very well informed. And they're saying, look, if you want to send your kids to the U.S. with uncle, whoever it is, this is the time because Trump's going to be elected. He's going to build a wall. It's going to be much more expensive. So you get a good deal now, a couple of thousand bucks. If you wait till the wall, it's going to go up to 10,000. What would anybody do rationally? Send the kids before the wall goes up. And you're seeing this rush. You're also seeing it, of course, from Cuba. Uh, this has been going on now for eight or nine months, perhaps about a year. Partly, partly, this is what the Cubans say, because a lot of people in Cuba think that with normalization, uh, the Cuban Adjustment Act of 65 will be repealed, and consequently Cubans will no longer be granted automatic residence, and consequently you better get in while the going is still good, because if you don't, you will not make it. Um, I think that that's one reason, but another equally powerful reason is that the economic situation in Cuba is deteriorating very seriously, almost day by day. And there's, there's not a day that goes by that you don't see some a newspaper item somewhere about Raul Castro, you know, shopping around for cheap oil anywhere. Iran, where Rouhani was there yesterday, uh, <clears throat> with the Chinese, uh, with the Algerians, with just not anybody, because Venezuelan oil, or cheap or free oil, is practically over. It's finished. And uh, as everyone knows, uh, the uh, high expectations for the success for you know, U.S. normalization or the economic consequences of U.S. normalization have not happened. They may occur. These expectations may, be, uh, may materialize six months, a year, or two years. But you know, every time you, know, you read the U.S. press or the international press and you see the same example repeated 30 times, it means there's no other one. So if you read about how many times have you seen that Airbnb is already in Havana and JetBlue is flying to Havana and there's a cruise ship that had always landed, for example, and then you read the next article, same three examples, and then you read another 30 articles, same three examples. You know why? Because those are the only three examples. Take away, for example. That's what there is. That's all there is and there is nothing. The economic consequences are insignificant. They're meaningless so far. They may change over time, but for the moment they haven't. So uh, the immigration situation is very serious, 
And there's a fallacy involving the Mexican immigration situation, which some very skillful and very well-meaning, well-intentioned uh, American expor- experts have uh, sold people on. And uh, in many ways, I'm glad they have and that they've been successful. The only problem, of course, is that it's not true. But that's not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, a big deal. I mean, there's, there's much to be said for hypocrisy and and manipulating the facts. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And this is this famous net zero immigration from Mexico, that all of a sudden, a few years ago, everybody, in all the Mexicans in the United States started going home, and the Mexicans in Mexico stopped coming here, and so now we have net zero. Well, you have net zero if you consider President Obama's 1.5 million deport, Mexican deportees as voluntary returnees. Yes, then you have net zero. If you deport, Obama deported about 2.3, 2.4 million people back to Mexico and Central America over his eight years, of which about a million and a half were Mexicans. If you consider those to be voluntary returns, uh, yes, then you have net zero. If you had not deported those million and a half, like happened the previous hundred years, more or less, with the exception of after World War II and Operation Wetback in the early 50s, then you would have roughly a million and a half more Mexicans here. And I've been, you know, writing and asking around and stuff, I'm maybe going to take out an ad in some of the Spanish papers or Univision, that if somebody can find me a single Mexican in the U.S., who has a job, who doesn't want to retire, and who wants to go back to Mexico, I'll, I'll build a monument or a statue in his honor. I'll pay for it. I don't know how. I'll find somebody to finance it. But even j- just one guy, one guy, I don't need more, just one. There is no such person. You have to be absolutely nuts if you're already here and making 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour to go back to Mexico to make, if you're well paid, maybe $300 a month. That's well paid. 70% of all Mexicans make less than $300 a month. 70%. This is formal and informal sector. 6,000 pesos a month. This is what an automobile worker in a new Japanese plant in Guanajuato makes. Not the old stuff, the new stuff. In the orange groves in Veracruz, which are modern, competitive, capital intensive, daily wage for picking oranges all day long in the heat of central Veracruz is <clears throat> approximately $6 a day. If you know anybody who's cra- any Mexican who's crazy enough to leave the job he has here and voluntarily go home to that, please let me know. And you know, I'll do scholarship for his kids. I'll, 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 I'll do something. Uh, and this nonsense I hear from so many people, even serious people, saying, you know, pe- Mexicans are returning to Mexico. The U.S. economy is doing terribly, and the Mexican economy is booming, so they all want to go back. Uh-huh. Like, where do they live? The U.S. economy will grow this year about 50% more than the Mexican economy. Mexican economy has been stagnant for the last 15 years and for the four years of this administration, and will continue to be so. So anyway, that's, that issue is still there. And finally, let's look a little bit forward, uh, Trump and, and Clinton for uh, Latin America. Well, obviously, I'm not going to say anything you would not have expected a Mexican to say. Uh, I think, obviously, Trump's election would be a huge disaster for Mexico. Uh, I can't conceive of any circumstances under which it would be a positive or favorable development for Mexico uh, or for Central America or for the Caribbean. The South America, maybe it doesn't matter a whole lot 
I can see where most people, frankly, don't care that much. They're even a little perplexed about why we get so excited about all of this. Uh, and then they know about the wall and everything else and everything. But, but at the end of the day, this is really a Caribbean Basin issue much more than a South American issue. Um, but at least for all of these countries, which is a lot of countries and a lot of people, uh, I think it would be an unmitigated disaster. Uh, it would be an unmitigated disaster, one, uh, because of the deportations that he says he will carry out. And I am not one who believes that none of this will happen if he wins either because he, won't, does, he doesn't really mean it or because the Congress will not let him do it or because, I don't know, his cabinet, whoever the hell won't. I, I don't subscribe to any of that uh, on issue by issue. Issue one, deportations. If Obama was able to deport, what, two million people, a little more than two million people, and said he didn't want to deport them, well, why can't Trump deport, let's say, four million if he wants to? He says he wants to. Maybe he can't deport all 12 million who are still here, people without papers, which half are Mexican or half are not, but he certainly could deport twice as many as Obama. Why not? I don't see no, re everybody knows where they are. It's very easy to find them. Uh, it's expensive, but it's not outrageously expensive. And you can pressure a bunch of people, including my country, into paying for part of it or taking them back or whatever. So, and four million deportees is a hell of a lot of people, especially if, you know, half of them are Mexican. And the other half are Honduran, Guatemalan, Salvadorian, Ecuadorian. I, this is a huge disaster. I mean, this is not, this is not a minor affair. And yeah, he'll never do it. Forget what, why not? Obama did it. Second, the wall. The wall is a perfectly feasible, uh, promise to fulfill. To begin with, because a good part of the wall is already built. The wall started being built by President Bill Clinton in 1994. That's when it started. The wall went up in Playas de Tijuana on the border all the way to Otay in 1994-95. And ever since then, people cannot cross there. They have to cross through the Sonora Desert, which made the price go way up, made the number of deaths and the risk go way up and made it much more attractive for organized crime to get into the people smuggling business because it became business. Before, the guys who helped you cross were sort of like Sherpas, you know? You gotta go this way and then make a left and then make a right, and oh, well, if you don't know exactly what left and right means, I'll help you, da 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 da, -da. No big deal. Cross the desert, that's a big deal, and I'm gonna, it's gonna cost you three, four, five thousand bucks, and you might die. But this began in 1994, and then Bush came along, and for the same mistaken reason, in my opinion, uh, Obama uh, uh, <clears throat> committed himself to, decided that he was going to buy conservative Republican votes for immigration reform by building a par another part of the wall. And he started building a part of the wall, and he didn't get any immigration reform. He failed twice, with McCain-Kennedy in 2006 and with his own reform in 2007 or eight. So no reform, but got the wall. And then Obama came along, and with his gang of eight and all this, started doing the same thing. All right, I'll give the Republicans a wall uh, as long as they vote for immigration reform. And he built the wall, and the Republicans did not vote for it. Or they voted for it in the Senate, but not in the House. Uh, another bunch of miles of wall. So actually today, you have somewhere like 40% uh, of the 1,700 miles of the wall uh, that is already there. So why can't Trump do what he has promised to do if his three predecessors did a lot of it without wanting to? He wants to. They didn't want to, and they did it. He wants to. Well, why in the world can't he do it? And then the third point, which is much more Mexican than Central American or Caribbean, is the question of NAFTA and uh, you know, trying to roll back 
uh, if not NAFTA, at least the uh, flow of jobs or investment from the U.S. manufacturing belts to Mexico and to a lesser extent Central America. Well, you know, that's uh, anybody's guess. Legally, he probably can't do it. In other words, it's not an executive decision to tell Ford not to uh, close down some plant somewhere a couple of days ago or a week ago and make that same car in Mexico somewhere. But how much pressure, how much jawboning from the White House can a bunch of these companies tolerate before they cave? That's anybody's guess. I, I don't know, but, you know, excuse me, Mr. So-and-so, CEO of God knows what, uh, the president is on the line, he'd like to speak to you. This is the White House. Uh, can you please hold for President Trump? Jesus, it sounds terrible. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. How many calls can these people tolerate? How much pressure can they withstand? Re regardless of the legalities of it, then that they can take this to a NAFTA panel, dispute settlement, blah, blah, blah. And they go, yeah, I know they can do all of that. How many CEOs are going to do that? On the other hand, how many phone calls is Trump going to make? Well, we don't know. What we do know is that you sort of got, you have to be a little crazy if you're a huge American corporation today that is thinking of going to Mexico and shutting something down in Indiana. Well, you're probably going to postpone that decision until you figure out exactly what Trump wants to do if he's elected. You know, who's his trade representative, who's his commerce secretary, who's his this, who's his that, and what is he going to do, and blah, 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 and what the Senate looks like, and what the House looks like, and all this stuff. So the first thing you're going to do is wait. Well, that's pretty disastrous. <laughs> and I, so I think that, you know, a, a Trump uh, presidency for Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean would be disastrous. In addition to which, he just said that he was going to roll back uh, Cuba normalization. Maybe he doesn't mean it. Maybe it's just for Florida purposes. Or maybe he does mean it. Uh, and although, you know, this has not been the huge success story that a lot of people have built it at as uh, here in Washington and other places, uh, I think it's certainly been a better development than the alternative. And this is a much better policy than the one that was in place before for the United States and for Cuba and for everybody. And rolling it back, which he can do because everything Obama has done has been by executive decree. Uh, none of it has been approved by Congress. So he can just, you know, suppress, delete the executive degrees and decrees and go back. On, on Hillary Clinton, it's a, it's a tough call what her attitude towards Latin America and Mexico and places like this would be. I don't think she certainly would not roll back the Cuba thing. Probably her anti-TPP stance would soften a little bit, uh, like her husband softened on NAFTA in 93. Um, and perhaps it would, you know, what she would demand in terms of renegotiation with some countries would not be bad. In other words, that these bilateral letters that were uh, put together on the side of TPP with Malaysia and Thailand and I don't know who else, uh, be extended to many other countries, including Mexico, and that they not be just letters of intent, but that they be included in the treaty. And if some country doesn't want them, too bad. But I don't think that would be a bad idea at all. I'm, you know, very much in favor of linking trade to labor rights, to environmental rights, to human rights in general. And uh, I, I think, you know, TPP falls far short of what she once called the gold standard of trade deals. The gold standard of trade deals are many of the trade deals that are signed, including by countries like Mexico, with the European Union, where you have a democracy clause, you have a human rights clause, you have all this stuff, and, you know, if uh, either side fools around with this stuff, the trade benefits disappear. I'm a big uh, supporter of uh, linking trade to human rights and, and democracy. Absolutely. I see no good reason why not to do so. Uh, so I think that would not be all that bad 
on, on trade issues and on the Cuba issue. Um, I also think on questions such as human rights, she'd be much uh, more engaged than Trump. And my impression, I have no idea, but my impression, I stand to be corrected, of course, uh, is that Trump doesn't care about human rights either way. This is not something that's on his uh, radar screen. He's not in favor of them. He's not against them. He doesn't care about them. It's not, a, not an issue. And I think she does. And I think she would be much more forceful on human rights issues even than Obama has been in Latin America. Um, and I hope she would become more forceful on the question of corruption. Uh, partly because she has FATCA and Obama didn't really have it except this year or last two years. And she will have FATCA from the get-go. And FATCA allows you to do a bunch of stuff because, as you know, either through the OECD uh, arrangement or bilateral FATCA agreements, uh, every uh, government that gives information to the U.S. on American assets in their country uh, is allowed to ask the U.S. for information on their nationals' accounts in the U.S., and, you know, we, we all know where most of the money that is stolen in Latin America goes. Here. Some of it goes to Switzerland and here and there and blah, blah, blah. But no self-respecting Latin America prefers to have to go to Luxembourg or Liechtenstein if he can go to Miami. I mean, where would you want to have your money? In Miami. Not, it's cold. It's far away. They speak a strange language in these places. And, you know, why? Miami is home. That's where you stash your money away. And all of these governments could you know, carry out much more effective anti-corruption drives and practices if they had U.S. cooperation, specifically through FATCA. So I think that this is something where she could be more sensitive to, and I also think she would be much more forthcoming than Obama on human rights issues, very tougher, and probably more amenable to change the drug, the U.S. drug stance. The problem with, with Hillary Clinton, I'll stop here, on Latin America, is I have the feeling, and it's a pure feeling, I've only been with her a couple of times, I don't know her well at all, uh, I know a lot of her people, but I know a lot of people who do know her. She doesn't really like the place. And I know she doesn't really like Mexico. I don't know if something happened on the honeymoon in Acapulco or whatever, or didn't happen. I don't know. Uh, hard to say. Uh, but she doesn't, there's something there that she just, she's just not comfortable with it. It's not something she, she, she had a very good time once in Cartagena at one of these summits or something. She's, and that, and that she liked. And, uh, but that was about the only time she seems to have enjoyed one of the many, many, many trips she made as Secretary of State and as First Lady before, uh, and as Senator also, uh, she's, and particularly Mexico. So I'm a little worried in that sense that for different reasons she would be sort of distant from a region that needs U.S. cooperation or cooperation between the two areas more than ever. Uh, not U.S. intervention, not U.S. pulling back. No, just engagement. Significant, constant, multifaceted engagement. And I'm a little worried that she would not be um, that engaged, that there are other places in the world that she's... Uh, uh, emotionally more involved with. Geopolitics will determine at the end of the day where she really spends her time on what she spends her time on. It won't be her affections, obviously. You know, we would, this is, that would be silly. But there's a little margin somewhere where affections matter. And somehow, I don't know, I get the impression she's not. A big fan. But anyway, on that uh, highly psychoanalytical sidewalk psychoanalysis uh, uh, <laughs> note, I will conclude and open this up for discussion. And again, thank you very much for, for bringing me here. Thank you.
start now with, uh, as uh, Jorge indicated, the questions and answers. And uh, in the good Latin American tradition, I'm going to make the first one, <laughs> since I'm here. Talking about immigration, particularly children from Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala, uh, the administration thought, or the idea they were putting forward, was that if the economies in those three countries grew, then there would be no immigration of children. You know. So there was a, a, a great brouhaha in uh, approving some money. Didn't sound to me really <laughs> too much. Do you have any news about uh, what's happened with this? I mean, if, if I recall correctly, it ended up being a three-year package for five countries of around $800 million. So if you start, you know, doing the math, that ends up being a very small amount of money for each one of the countries for each one of the years. Five countries because they included Costa Rica and Nicaragua, which are really not that much part of the problem. But your people and the Nicaraguans always get upset when somebody excludes them from something. And so they say, what the hell, we'll throw them in too. And so they're doing it for them. Let, let them keep uh, right. Yeah. It's not real money. I mean, it, it's not, you know, these are small countries and they're poor countries, but they're not that small and they're not that poor. And so you, that's not going to make a difference, uh, firstly. Secondly, you know, there's a very indirect uh, cause and effect relationship. It takes a while, especially when the reason people are fleeing the three northern triangle countries mm -hmm. is not only a bad economic situation, it's violence. At the very end of the day, the violence probably comes from the uh, lack of economic growth. Da, 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 da. Yeah, fine. But that's at the end of the day, during the beginning of the day and the middle of the day and not before the end of the day, the violence has its own reasons. Among them, the Maras who were deported from Los Angeles uh, in the 90s uh, back to El Salvador and back to Honduras mainly, uh, plus the drug trade. It was, you know, seemed like a great idea to have the Mexicans, you know, go overboard in stopping drugs from entering the United States through Mexico, except that then they decided to do it through Central America, where it just so happens the state capacity is about a thousand times weaker than in Mexico, as weak as it is in Mexico. And so this stuff you don't fix with economic growth overnight. Over time you do, but you certainly don't fix it overnight. And so I think really this whole notion uh, of what of Biden's plan for the three countries and what was finally approved, it, it, it's not significant. It won't make a difference, which is why it hasn't made a difference. The violence is not down, and the migrant children or not children are not down. And basically the people who, who are carrying the whole burden are the Mexicans. We're the ones who are basic, doing, basically doing the United States dirty work for it. That's what we're doing. But the worst part about it is we're not even doing what the Turks do. The Turks, you know, this is a very cynical arrangement between the Germans and the Turks. Okay, but this is, there's nothing wrong with cynicism. It's hypocrisy. There's a lot to be said for cynicism and hypocrisy. The Germans said we want you guys to stop the flow of Syrians and the other guys, all right? And the Turks said, sure, absolutely. Mm, you know, piece of cake. Here's the bill. <laughs> Six billion euros a year plus visa waiver, visa, visa waiver for Turks, plus new accession talks. Take it or leave it. So all the Germans are up in arms, human rights, Erdogan throws everybody in jail, we're not going to do visa waiver for these guys, accession, we've got to be crazy to let these guys into the European Union, blah, 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 blah. Turks said, hey, not a problem. But oh, by the way, you Syrian guys, make yourselves at home. Just make sure you shut the door as you leave. 
and the Germans are finally making the deal. I, I, I see nothing wrong with that. It, it is a little bit cynical, and I'm not sure it's a great idea for the European Union to waive human rights considerations to such an extent as they're doing it. Okay, But at least the Turks are getting something out of it. We're doing this for free. We're getting absolutely nothing in exchange for this nonsense. And obviously we're overextended. The Mexican armed forces are overextended. We're increasing abuses, human rights violations, extortion, corruption on our southern border because we're doing the dirty work and we don't have the cap capability of doing it. So that's, I think, what's really happening. That U.S. policy towards the Northern Triangle is Mexico doing the dirty work. That's the real policy. Okay, very good. We go from the left towards the right, or perhaps we'll try today from the right to the left. <laughs> the gentleman in the gray suit. Thank you very much. I'm Richard Sawoya with the National Foreign Trade Council. First of all, thank you for um, <laughs> A wonderful presentation. Um, if one thing comes through, it is the irony of events, which is the iron law of history. And it's deeply appreciated in your presentation. One point of fact, which is a further irony, uh, with respect to the, the fact that light crude is going to Venezuela, um, that is a direct result of the action that was taken by Congress that was signed into law to repeal the um, 30-year or more law against export of crude. And it is independent producers that brought the revolution to the United States and the renovation of the North American province that are taking advantage of that, given what crude prices are, um, to, to sell light crude. And there's nothing the government can do any longer to stop that. Now, whether that's good policy with respect to Venezuela is another issue. Uh, just a comment. I mean, I, I, I stand to be corrected. My impression, but I'm really far from being an expert on them, is that when Congress voted, this was about six months ago, or very recently, if I'm not mistaken. That? Last year. Last year. Um, they did reserve a, sort of a, a space for presidential decision to not allow exports of crude if he, if the president considered that a series of reasons could be invoked, like the previous prohibition allowed the president to waive the uh, pro prohibiting the export of crude if he so dis he or she so decided that it was in the U.S. national interest. So actually, in this particular case, Obama could tell those independent sellers of oil to Venezuela, "Look, this is not a good idea." Right. So, so he could not do it. it. It could not happen, or he could jawbone them into not doing it. In the last uh, row, the gentleman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I, I'm Leon Weintraub. I'm retired from the U.S. diplomatic service, a couple of, of tours in Latin America, but not in Mexico. I'd like to thank you again for an exceptionally lucid and clear and informative presentation. I have a, a question about the recent uh, invitation for candidate Trump to visit Mexico. It boggles the mind uh, what was in the Mexican, you were talking about, uh, sidewalk psychoanalysis. What was going through Mexican psychology to offer such an invitation, even if, even if as I think I heard, it was offered to both the candidates. And even if Hillary Clinton had also accepted, what good could, could possibly have come from the Mexican side to, to make such an offer? I just don't, don't, don't understand it. Well, I mean, to begin with, you know, psychoanalyze, sidewalk psychoanalyzing uh, Hillary Clinton is, you know, child's play compared to trying to understand what Peña Nieto was doing. Uh, I mean... I, I can give you the only two explanations that I have heard and that make sense to me uh, uh, with a caveat, which is that the uh, my impression is that the invitation to Hillary Clinton was pro forma, 
totally pro forma. They were not interested in her going at all. They just sent it because they didn't want to have it seen as if they were being too unilateral. Turns out, of course, they were. And either she never intended to go to Mexico or uh, she decided not to go once she saw what happened. Uh, I do I have heard that uh, President Peña Nieto uh, sought a meeting with her uh, Monday and Tuesday at the UN where he was and where she was and that obviously that meeting did not take place. So uh, that's on the two explanations, one is pretty much the official line, which is probably true, official, semi-official line, which is probably true. It is that the finance minister, Luis Videgaray, who is in fact, or was in fact, Mexico's prime minister, he was the guy who was gover has been governing the country for the past four years. President Peña Nieto is a charismatic uh, president with uh, you know a certain popular touch, and uh, who present, you know works well on the world stage, appears uh, confident, uh, good-looking, attractive wife. I mean, he he does all of that part well, and that's what he does. But the guy who's actually been governing has been uh, Videgaray. He's sort of the equivalent. I tried to use this analogy once when he got into trouble with a house uh, um, that he owned, that he bought, uh, Videgaray. Uh, he's sort of uh, uh, Eisenhower, Sherman Adams, the guy with the Vicuña coat. Some of you may remember that. Most of you are too young. Uh, anyway, um, he heard from somebody on Wall Street, big banker, somebody like that, something to the effect, look, you guys, you better, better establish some kind of back channel to the Trump people because they might actually win. And if they do... Uh, Mexico is going to be battered on the financial markets. The peso is going to collapse. Interest rates will go up on Mexican paper. It'll be a very tough time for a while. And if you can find a way of showing that you can get along with this guy, that will calm the markets a little bit. And so they got uh, decided that he was going to try and do this. Uh, but that he had to, it had to be very secretly done, because if it was leaked, then it wouldn't happen, and Peña would get into big trouble. So he held his cards very close to his vest. He didn't let anybody else in on this. He did it all by himself. And as is logical with finance ministers, even very technically competent ones like him, there is stuff that they don't know about. As a former foreign service officer, you, you know that you know the stuff of negotiating these things takes, uh, Ashley Darren also knows, takes a certain amount of experience. It, it's not rocket science, but you, you have to do certain things, you make certain deals, make sure you have certain commitments, that you have plan Bs if the commitment is not kept to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he didn't do any of that. He just kept his cards to his vest, as I said, and it didn't work. But that was the logic of it. That's one explanation. The other explanation, which I find a bit far-fetched, but I do not reject, I do not discard completely, is that both Videgaray and Peña uh, are increasingly worried about two uh, linked hypotheses. One is that the former mayor of Mexico City and uh, once again candidate for the presidency, uh, left of center uh, politician Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is very likely to win in 2018. And two, that if he does, it is quite likely that he will try to throw them both in jail on charges of corruption and or human rights violations. Uh, which would not be a terribly uh, surprising event, uh, nor a terribly unwarranted event, by the way, on either count. And so that they're both sort of worrying, you know, where the hell are we going to go? Uh, and what do we do to try our best for that not to happen? And one idea, which is not totally stupid, is, you know, if we can become friends with Trump soon enough, uh, 
maybe he will grant us some kind of protection. Yeah, generally, the United States doesn't do that. It has never harbored or supported former uh, corrupt or human rights violating heads of state. The U.S. never does that. It's always been, always has handed them over to new governments, you know, going back to 19th century. The U.S. is not in the business of doing that. But maybe this time it would be. I remember very well. And then you threw, and then Carter threw him out. First he shipped it, shipped it, to, shipped him to us in Mexico. Then we got rid of him. Uh, and then unfortunately he, he passed away, away very quickly in Egypt. Um, God knows what would have happened if he had lived. Um, uh, so with a few exceptions, <laughs> they may have thought that this was not, uh, a bad bet because there's not a whole bunch of other places you want to go to. I mean, you certainly don't want to go to North Korea. You know, they, 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 they didn't buy all these houses to then have to leave them and go and live in Pyongyang. I mean, who wants to do that? Uh, Havana is no longer a very safe bet. You don't want to bet on that. So where else do you go? The best place is here. And hope you can ride it out. That's another hypothesis. Improbable, but not absolutely uh, impossible. Very good. Frank. Hello, well, you, we learn a lot by listening to you. Um, I have a, 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 lots of people believe that uh, Hillary Clinton's, a Hillary Clinton administration will, for the most part, continue Mr. Obama's administration. Do you believe that she will continue uh, uh, deporting millions of people? She is, is her policy toward immigration policy building a wall? What can you tell us about that? Well, she has said she will suspend the deportation policies, and in fact, Obama himself uh, has begun to limit them enormously. I mean, the, 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 the two million are largely concentrated in the first four or five years of Obama's two terms. So even he has, uh, you know, stopped being the deporter in chief, as uh, several people have called him. Um, uh, and uh, she has said that she would stop these policies except with uh, 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 criminals, which is not a great idea either. I mean, that's where the violence in El Salvador comes from. It makes it, you know, it's intuitive. All right, what the hell? I mean, it looks like, looks like a piece, piece of cake again, you know. What do you do with a Salvadorian, whatever, rapist, murderer, drug dealer with tattoos all over him and he's sitting in some prison in California and he costs a fortune? Why the hell should he be there? Why don't we just send him back to El Salvador? Or when his term is over, she's a natural thing to do. Hey, let the Salvadorians take care of him. Well, you used to have one mean Salvadorian in jail. Now you have... 10 nice Salvadorian children in a detention center as a direct result of sending the one bad Salvadorian back. So it, it's not a very sensible policy even to deport criminals, quote unquote, as bad as they may be. It, it's, a more, it, it's more complicated than it seems than your, your normal, oh, come on, let's get rid of these guys. Well, okay. She says she won't do it. She has said that she would try and reach an immigration agreement uh, with the Republicans in her first hundred days. I always thought, though, of course, being Mexican, this issue is more important for me than uh, uh, other issues are for other people in the United States. I think Obama's big mistake was doing health care before immigration because he had the 60 votes for immigration and he was never going to get any Republican votes on health care anyway, and he didn't get them. And so uh, if he had done immigration before Kennedy died, granted he didn't know when Kennedy was going to die, but you know, given his age and everything, it was... So it, I think he made a huge mistake by not doing the immigration first when he had all his political capital. Uh, other, I always also understand that he had many reasons for doing health care first. Okay. She says she's going to do immigration first, that this is her first thing to try and fix, 
and that she can come up with something with the Republicans will depend a lot on what the Senate looks like and the House. I don't see any way right now in which the Democrats can rewin the House. They can retake the Senate, but I don't see the House. And so I don't see how we would get away from the famous Halstead rule that you have to have a majority of Republicans on board. And if you don't have them, and they wouldn't be on board, how you would do this. On the other hand, there is something that Obama never wanted to do, and which maybe she uh, is willing to do, which is to trade off immigration, immigration for something that the Republicans want, which is not linked to immigration. God knows what. I don't know. Social security reform or whatever, or a chief justice, I mean, a chief, uh, Supreme Court justice, or I don't know. I mean, obviously, if two, if one Republican president and one Democratic president, neither of the two, has been able to convince a large enough number of Republicans to pass immigration reform in now 10 years, then keeping on doing the same thing is going to bring the same result. You can't trade a wall for reform. We, everybody tried that. It didn't work. So maybe what she has to do is trade something else that these guys want for their support on immigration reform and with enough stuff so that it makes them comfortable. But at the end of the day, the deal has to look like the deal it is. You have to have some kind of amnesty for the 12 million people who are here, and you have to have some form of addressing future flows. If you don't have either of the two, it won't work. And I hope she understands that. Now we go to the, uh, to the left. Hi, <laughs> Lisa Garcia. Thank you so much for your comments. I'm curious, though, about your early comment that uh, Mr. Shannon should now pressure Colombia to um, uh, somehow ensure democracy. Like, there was a whole speech about what the U.S. should do in Colombia uh, following the peace treaty with the FARC. But in point, I just wonder how much leverage you think the United States has in that scenario at all, given that uh, Fidel Castro actually negotiated that peace treaty and has really sidelined the Organization of American States through his alternate uh, organization, the uh, Association of Caribbean States, which now includes all of Latin America, even if they're not in the Caribbean. And um, and additionally, a lot of the pressure that we exerted, not just in Colombia, but in all these countries, was through USAID in incentive dollars. If you fight, if you keep your drugs on your side of the border, we'll give you X money, you have to make this showing. But now, with drugs being legalized in the United States, uh, there's no carrot to offer. And so we've thrown 30 years of billions of dollars at Colombia with no success. Castro steps in, negotiates this treaty, this peace accord, which is kind of also contingent because there's like a little bit of a FARC retainer in the wings, right? I mean, how, where do we get off telling anybody what to do? I mean, I, I don't know how we're going to be effective there. Uh, would you give us your name and affiliate? Sure, they said Garcia, I'm an attorney, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not just Colombia. One of the difficulties that everybody has had to try and build a Latin American bloc that would pressure uh, Maduro to find some kind of solution to the Venezuelan mess uh, has been that Colombia who has by far the most statesmanlike, the most visionary president of anyone in Latin America, which is Juan Manuel Santos, has self-marginalized itself on the Venezuelan issue because Venezuela was a key factor in the negotiations because the guerrillas came and went to Cuba through Venezuela. And if he didn't have the Venezuelans on his side, he couldn't do this. And he decided to bet the store on the peace agreement. Uh, I think he was right. I think he got it. I think he will win the referendum. And I think this is a huge uh, achievement for uh, Colombia. But there was a price to pay, and that was accommodation with Chavez and then with Maduro. Okay. That is now over. On October 2nd, that's finished. Uh, Colombia can go back to a normal stance on the Venezuelan crisis, 
which is the application of the letter and spirit of the Inter-American Democratic Charter that was signed in Lima, uh, among others by Secretary Colin Powell and myself, on September 11th of 2001, the day of the uh, Twin Towers. And uh, uh, that Colombia can now pressure uh, the Venezuelans and the OAS to achieve. And he can do that, Santos can do that, with his moral authority and intelligence and experience, and in the company of Brazil and Argentina, who were both unconditional supporters of Chavez and Maduro before, and today are not, by any definition. And with Mexico, doesn't understand Mexico is sort of confused about this stuff, Venezuela, Colombia, which is which, who's where, I mean, you know, this is complicated stuff. They have to worry about Trump and, you know, what do I, this is complicated for our government to understand this stuff, but they can sort of. What all of these countries are basically saying is, look, you know, we are willing now to do something within the OAS, with Secretary General Almagro uh, on Venezuela, because the situation is far more serious, because we have no ideological sympathy for the regime unlike before. We're perfectly willing to do all of this, but the Americans have to come also uh, hold, us by, hold our hands. We're not going to do it without the Americans. And Shannon, is a, Shannon sort of says, well, why don't you guys do it and we'll lead from behind. And the Latin Americans say, you know, come on, you, you get, you're selling them oil. <laughs> uh, you're you're uh, <clears throat> holding up a series of things. You help and we'll help and then we can do it together. That's what I think, you know, Shannon and, and the U.S. should be doing. I know it sounds ridiculous, not because of the leverage. The leverage is always there. I think it sounds a little ridiculous because, you know, I'm sort of asking these people to do something when they're going to be out of office in three months. The problem is that these are the three crucial months. That has to do with Venezuelan timetable. And there is a tradition of a certain amount of continuity on U.S. foreign policy when there is a crisis uh, next door and Venezuela is next door. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Um, Jorge, thank you for the um, presentation. Um, I was um, with the Cuba Venezuela what, thing. What, excuse um, me, what is your name? I'm oh, Vincent with uh, Council of Hemispheric Affairs. Um, I have a I have a question about the Cuba Venezuela thing because it's very similar with how Washington has access policy on it, and um, with. Venezuela, we've come to the table many times with them. We came to the table with them in 2010 in the, at the Panama Summit in 2015. We talked to Maduro about um, the backtracking and trying to normalize these relations. But um, your point about the, um, the pressuring other Latin American countries to deal with Venezuela, um, it, um, the Obama administration said it was a security threat. Um, Congress Congress has to come to the table too and tackle on the issue, but what have, what are the diff, what have been the differences with the U.S. policy in Cuba in bringing American business and um, and new enterprises? Why haven't we done that in Venezuela? So, what has been the difference between the U.S. policy in Cuba and the policy in Venezuela? Thank you. Well, I mean, the difference is, the first difference is that the, the Castros want U.S. investment and trade and tourism desperately. They need them and they want them and they're doing everything they can do. And that, that's a problem in itself, whether they can do enough but that they can do to try and get them. And Obama is helping as much as he can, which is also limited. Uh, the Venezuelans don't want U.S. investment and don't want tourism and don't want trade and they want to have as little to do as possible with the United States except maintaining Citgo as a standing U.S. company uh, here and maintaining their credit rating up to a point uh, and not defaulting on their huge foreign debt and uh, 
finally being now able to purchase uh, light crude in order to sell their mix. Um, so the U.S. policy is very different now. The, I'm not saying the U.S. should pressure either Venezuela or the Latin Americans to bring about regime change or anything in Venezuela. Just two very simple things. One, the broad issue of respecting the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which Venezuela signed on that same day in Lima, Peru. In other words, they are a party to that charter, like everybody else is. Not Cuba. Cuba never was, and so the Cubans can perfectly well say, hey, or the American Convention on Human Rights, the so-called San Jose Pact of 68. Cubans can say, hey, we never signed that stuff. That's not for us. You know, it's like the state of Texas. We didn't sign the... Geneva Conventions, <laughs> okay, well, the Cubans say we didn't sign this stuff, and they're actually right, they didn't, okay. The Venezuelans did, and they're still members of the OAS, and they're members of the Inter-American Development Bank, so they should be pressured into respecting what they signed, one. And two, they should be pressured into respecting their own constitution, because violating their own constitution is a violation of that charter and respecting their constitution, meaning holding the recall election before the date runs out. And that means counting the signatures on time, expeditiously, uh, uh, in an organized and transparent manner. And there is no good reason why the U.S. and the Colombians and the Mexicans and the Brazilians and the Argentines should not pressure them into doing that. The Secretary General of the OAS has said as much, so why in the world is Tom Shannon now all of a sudden, uh, his new best friend is uh, uh, Maduro and uh, the foreign minister, Daisy, como se llama, como se llama la, la, la canciller venezolana, Daisy no sé cuántos, Rodriguez, perdón, Daisy Rodriguez, new best friend. But that's the logic. It's a very different focus of what U.S. policy towards Cuba was before Obama or with Obama. It's a totally different situation. I mean, and the reason is not to make them... You know, there is a very serious crisis going on in Venezuela. There's a humanitarian crisis. There is a, a food crisis. There is a human rights crisis. There's a, a very serious crisis right now going on in Venezuela, which can spill over to a bunch of places. Chris? Hello, Professor. I'm Christopher Sands, and I'm at Johns Hopkins SICE. I wanted to ask you a question about a country that hasn't come up yet, um, Canada. Uh, as to most of you folks, because you know I like Canadians. Um, <laughs> I'm curious what you think Canada's role in this transition in the United States might be? Uh, the Canadians have looked at Mexico in particular with ambivalence. Do we embrace the Mexicans if it's a rough ride, or do we run the other direction and, and let them you know, take the nafta heat by themselves? They have a prime minister who has pretty hair and is probably more popular in the United States than either Trump or Clinton. Um, do you expect the, anything from the Canadians, or um, would you suggest anything to the Canadians in this particular moment? Well, I, mean, I think this goes back to perhaps the trade discussions with, uh, in a hypothetical or theoretical Clinton administration. You know, that I, I think there were real issues pending from NAFTA that were valid at the time when they were when NAFTA was debated, and which were largely ignored. Uh, first of all, because of the sort of free trade obsession that the Bush people had, firstly, and then even that Clinton had. And they ignored a lot of issues both in Mexico and in the United States. I imagine in Canada also, but I don't know that as a fact. And I think these issues now have to be addressed. And I think a lot could be gained not by renegotiating NAFTA or even reopening it, but adding on, building on it in many directions. And I would think that you know, Trudeau looks like an ideal partner for doing something like this with a Clinton administration here and with the new government in Mexico as of 2018. Peña is way too much of a lame duck and way too much of an insular, not to use another term, uh, president, uh, uh, for that to happen. It can't happen with him, but it's, it's only two years away. 
And unless this left of center candidate wins, practically any other possible candidate would be interested in some kind of review or building on, on NAFTA on, in many of these areas. In that sense, I think Trudeau could be a, a very good partner. Harper was not. Harper was a disaster for all of this. And, and Chrétien was very complicated. You know, at the end of the day, Chrétien was a guy, you know, ended up being pro-NAFTA, voted for it, what have you. But he was fundamentally, like most Canadians, anti-trilateral. Canadians don't like trilateralism. That's, you know, they like acronyms and they don't like trilateralism. And this is a problem with the Canadians for us, not for them and not for other people, but for us Mexicans. It is because it's always them that start putting up objections. So they, they, they let the Americans off scot-free. Instead of both of us either forcing the Americans to be the ones who say no uh, or saying yes, the Canadians say, no, 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 we don't want to hear about stuff. I remember, I mean, it was a very good, good fellow, wonderful fellow, John Manley, who was a deputy prime minister and foreign minister in 9-11. And so I began talking with him at the time, you know, can we do something, a common security perimeter, something that will make life easier for both of us now that the Americans are understandably going to go ballistic over this. And he said, yeah, except that, you know, you're going to have to do this on your own and we're going to do it on our own because we don't want to contaminate our border with your border. It wasn't a very nice thing to say. At least it was sincere. <laughs> it wasn't very nice. But it, it reflects that attitude. Now, I would hope Trudeau would have a different attitude, and maybe he will, but there's something more powerful in Canada beyond Trudeau, which is very anti-trilateral. What I'm particularly uh, excited about in the case of Trudeau, and I hope he gets to it quickly, is the marijuana issue. Because if Canada does, uh, at a federal level, uh, legalize recreational uh, use and production of marijuana, which is what he promised to do during his campaign, that will also have a huge impact in Mexico and other places. Um. The gentleman here. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Nate Ropes, and I'm a reporter with Inside U.S. Trade. I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about kind of your take on labor reforms in Mexico, Peru, Colombia, or at least the labor issues that have been raised in Colombia, especially in relation to trade deals. Do you see that moving anywhere in any of the countries that have been mentioned, uh, especially the Obama and the lame duck? And then. I know there's uh, legislation that's been proposed in Mexico. Do you see that moving anytime soon uh, to address some of their issues, such as uh, with the labor courts? Such as? Labor courts. Uh, uh, so eliminating the juntas de, yeah. de conciliación y trabajo. Uh, in the case of Mexico, which is really the only country I could, and I'm certainly not knowledgeable about it even there, but uh, this I've followed a little bit, uh, I don't see the Peña Nieto administration having the political capital left for that kind of reform, which, which is a is major reform in Mexico. It's a big deal. And I think it's necessary and desirable and everything, but I don't see him having the, uh, the, 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 the clout to do that, especially that, you know, at the end of the day, this would hurt some of the unions, and the unions continue to be the stalwarts of the, of the PRI. And he needs them at election time, and I, I don't see. I don't think he would mess with it. I don't, I don't think he will. No, again, I mean, if you stick some of this stuff, Mexico made a big fuss of no labor letter or human rights letter or no parallel stuff for Mexico on TPP. You know, we're not Vietnam, we're not Malaysia, we're not Thailand. None of this stuff for Mexico. We're a democracy. Ta da ta da da ta da da. And the Americans and you know Froman bought it. Um, I'm not sure I would be opposed to uh, Hillary Clinton uh, coming back to that and say, "Wait a second, you're, you're maybe you're not Vietnam, but you're, you're certainly not uh, Norway or whatever, or you're not Chile, or you're not even, you're not Brazil." I mean, labor rights in Mexico are not at the standard, let alone of Western Europe. They're not at the standard of many countries in Latin America. And if this is a way to get it done, then why not? Through TPP. Mexico says, then we won't sign it. Don't sign it. 
I think, you know, the Obama people chickened out on it too easily. They just got the Asians, but they didn't push us and, or the Peruvians, to the best of my knowledge. We have time for two questions. Yes. Y aquí está la, la joven también porque lleva mucho tiempo con su mano. ¿Cuál, cuál? Esta de aquí, al lado de tu esposa. Ah, la otra joven. La otra jo Las dos jóvenes. I thank you, Professor Saucedo from the Mission of Mexico to the OAS. So, in case Trump wins the elections, how do you think Mexico should prepare to the, or what reforms they should do from the immigration problems that we are going to have It, with the deportation in case of the minimum of two, two billion people going back to Mexico or and the pain the wall um, issues because the Senate of Mexico pronounced against that and they said they're working in some I don't know some reforms to, to stop that or to avoid that so how do you think Mexico should should prepare or what actions should Mexico government do in that scenario? I mean, obviously there's not a lot we can do until we know, well, first of all, if Trump's elected or not, if not, end of story. And if he is elected and once he takes office and then begins to actually show us what he wants to do and then make certain decisions. I think we should be serious about this. Uh, I, I like... Uh, The senator who proposed something, Armando Rios Peter, is a nice guy, he's a good friend, he's an intelligent fellow, but this is not serious. You know, to forbid Mexican federal money to be used for paying the wall. <laughs> yeah, you don't need the Senate to pass a resolution for that. Just don't do it. But that's not the way he's going to get, Trump is going to get people, Mexicans or Mexico, to pay for the wall. If he really wants Mexicans to pay for the wall, he has many ways of getting many Mexicans to pay for the wall. Increasing the fee for visas, which is a decision made by the State Department, not by Congress. Increasing the toll on the bridges, again, done by CBP, etc., not by the Congress. Uh, increase taxing remittances. That's more complicated in terms of congressional approval or not, but there are ways of doing it. It's transaction fees, co commissions, etc., etc., special fee for, blah, 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 blah. So it's, that's silly. Rios Peter's thing is, es una, es una tontería. Now, uh, I think what the president should begin to do with the Senate, right, that I do agree with, is to have a national conversation in Mexico to educate the Mexican people and Mexican civil society and the Mexican business community, et cetera, about what this means, what a Trump victory means for Mexico. And he can start doing that on November 9th if by some tragedy this happens. I'm not sure at this stage it's a good idea to do it anymore. He should have done it a year ago when it became in very likely, as many of us said and wrote and spoke out as early as a, more than a year ago, that it was very likely that Trump would be the Republican candidate and that the moment he becomes a Republican candidate, he becomes a viable per candidate to win the election. Why? Because you have a two-party system and in a two-party system you never know what happens. This notion that I know as a fact that he's going to lose, well, how the hell do you know as a fact that he's going to lose? And what has happened is, well, it, it, it's sufficiently possible that he might win, that Peña went and did this stupid thing of inviting him to Mexico. He didn't invite him to Mexico because he was sure he was going to lose. He invited him to Mexico because he thinks he might win. And he's right, he might win. So he should have started doing all of this a year ago. He didn't. Okay. Now, the issue is to begin a national conversation on what the United States means for Mexico, what Trump means for Mexico, what U.S. politics means for Mexico. Where are we going to fight against the construction of the wall? Forget paying for it. Paying for it is, is a non-issue. It's silly. That's not the point. If Trump wants to make it a big deal, who cares? That's not the point. The point is, are we just going to continue saying what Peña stupidly said with Trump at his side? This is a domestic U.S. issue. 
Are we going to sustain that position that the wall is a domestic U.S. issue? Or are we going to read that it's not a U.S. domestic issue? It's a bilateral issue. And we're going to come to the United States and wherever we can, through our consulates, through our leaders, through many people, to fight against the wall in the U.S., in Congress, in the border states, in the border communities, in the Mexican communities, or not. Where, where, where are we going to take this to? But you, you have to start talking about this, not keep it a secret. That's the first thing, I think, which is the most important one. Are we going to fight this, and where and how are we going to fight it? On NAFTA, we've heard 10 different stances. First, the foreign minister says, I'm, we're open to reviewing it. Then she says, we're not going to reopen it, but we're open to talking about it. Well, yeah, I mean, we can't say I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> but so what is our stance on this? And what does it imply? And is there a serious possibility that the flow of investment from the U.S. to Mexico, which is the only thing that is working in the Mexi that has worked in the Mexican economy over the last 20 years, Remember, we grow 2% a year, 2.5% per year. That's all we do. And the only part that grows is the manufacturing export sector, a little bit the agricultural export sector, but it's mainly manufacturing. So this is a big deal for us. Well, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> That's part of the conversation also. Uh, I, I think that this is what logically... Uh, we should be doing, and the president should appoint uh, 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 a point man, name a point person. If it's going to be the foreign minister, fine, then, she, then it's her. But then he does what she says. He doesn't go and ask the finance minister to set up a meeting with, I don't know, uh, uh, King Jong-il. Go and live in Pyongyang. I mean, no, you, you do it through the foreign minister if that's your point person. You don't want it to be the foreign minister. competent and say well yeah you 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 you're in charge they should have the what they're going to say on November 9th in the morning or November 8th at night. What are they going to say if Trump wins? They should, they should have the, what they're going to say on November 9th in the morning or November 8th at night. What are they going to say if Trump wins? They should be having that discussion now with who, whoever he wants. I hope they're doing it. Um, I'm afraid they're not. I think we have one last question. Yes. Hi, my name is Lauren Bally. I'm with the Middle News Service. Um, I was asking if you could elaborate a little bit because you mentioned that you think that Hillary will, will be more forthcoming on human rights issues than Obama. But um, considering Hillary's supposed role in the 2009 Honduras coup, coup and uh, her role supposedly in the assassination of the human rights activist, uh, I think, yeah, Berta, um, those two things kind of seem to conflict with each other. So I was just wondering what you think her uh, forthcoming human rights may be in the United States. I think she's, you know, more interested in the issue than uh, Obama has been, at least as regards Latin America. Uh, I don't think Obama has paid a great deal of attention, even though uh, Tom Malinowski was his guy on for the second term. And Tom's a great, great person, a great activist, very committed to human rights. Uh, Obama has not been that forthcoming, or not forthcoming, has not been uh, that emphatic on the importance of human rights uh, in U.S. relations with Latin America. He has talked about it on occasion, but he really hasn't been, I think, forceful. And I'm not referring to the Cuba question. Now, Hillary... The Honduras thing blindsided her like it blindsided a lot of people. And, you know, I know that the ALBA countries and a lot of ALBA sympathizers in the United States 
uh, decided that somehow the Obama people and consequently her as Secretary of State were responsible for the coup against Zelaya. You know, uh, so when you ask them, well, exactly how did that happen? They say, well, what happened really was that uh, she didn't do enough to bring Zelaya back into power. Well, as a matter of fact, she did a lot. She got sanctions, she got the IDB and the World Bank to suspend credits, she did a bunch of stuff as much as she could reasonably do. She got OAS resolutions and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, short of sending the Marines in, there was not a whole lot more she could do. Uh, now, was she sympathetic to Celaya being overthrown? I imagine she was. I don't imagine anybody, a reasonable person, being uh, terribly upset about, you know, throwing out a guy like him, especially if a certain degree of constitutional formality was followed. Granted, it looked very much like a, like a coup. It smelled like a coup. It probably was a coup, but they respected a certain formality. But my impression is that she's someone who attaches greater importance to human rights in U.S.-Latin American relations than Obama has. Um, she was not forceful enough, enough on it with Russia, with the Russian reset. She was much more forceful about it with the Chinese as uh, Secretary of State. And I think that as president, she would bring that experience and you know, not be as cynical as her husband was, uh, who acknowledged, by the way, with hindsight, of course, that his single greatest mistake was not getting involved in the Rwanda uh, genocide. Uh, well, that was fundamentally a human rights issue. And he didn't get involved because, you know, who the hell cares? Well, that's not, I, I hope she learned from that like he did, and that she uh, understands that human rights issues are fundamental. In Mexico, in Venezuela, in other countries where they may pop up, wherever that may be, obviously in a difference, I mean, just something as simple as are the people fleeing the violence in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala? Are they refugees, yes or not? Is, are their lives in danger? Yes or no? And that is, at the end of the day, a political legal decision. But it's not just a legal decision, because the definition of danger, it doesn't mean there has to be a guy who wants a government, a soldier who wants to come and shoot you. It can be somebody else who wants to come and shoot you. Can you be a refugee from, non, from violence exercised by non-state actors? Yes. But that's a decision at the end of the day that the State Department and the, has, has to make and Homeland Security. Thank you Thank very you. much. efforts in putting together the, this event and of course we thank very much Professor Castaneda to come our way and um, let us share your vast knowledge of uh, Latin America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.